semester section online training program uh, on basic advances in veterinary and clinical pathology. Dr. Binod Kumar is a veterinary parasitologist who did his specialization in veterinary parasitology from ICR IVRI, Ijatnagar Bareli. For his post-graduation research, he received prestigious Dr. J.P. Dubey Young Scientist Award 2010, and he also received ICR SRF Fellowship during his PhD studies. He joined in the Department of Veterinary Parasitology, uh, Col College of Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry, Junagad, Gujarat, as an assistant professor in the year 2012. And since then, he is serving the society with different uh, capacities as academician, researcher, extension worker, administrator, as HOD from time to time. He has successfully guided each one of MBSc and PhD students. He has authored for about 16 national international research articles, more than 200 gen bank submissions, four books, nine book chapters, seven practical training manuals. He has presented research papers in different national and international conferences and received best oral and poster presentation awards. He has joined as associate professor in Kubas Kishanganj in April 2023 and presently he is working in this institute as a as associate professor in the Department of Veterinary Parasitology. Today, he will deliver a lecture on the topic, Basic and Novel Approaches of Parasite Detection in Various Samples. I welcome you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you, Dipti. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thanks the organizer who has invited me to deliver the lecture in the online training program, Basics and Advances in Veterinary Clinical Pathology. So uh, this is a very uh, right topic that uh, the different uh, from uh, traditional to the advances, what happens in the field of the clinical pathology um, that uh, uh, lectures delivered and the knowledge and information passed on to the uh, learned uh, participants. So uh, uh, my topic accordingly given, and uh, you know that the parasitology, microbiology, pathology, they are called as the preclinical uh, department and uh, they are very much helpful in arriving the diagnosis of the uh, diseases so uh, the uh, this uh, training uh, regarding the clinical pathology including the the techniques used in detection of the parasites uh, today we will we will dealt with that so uh, without much wasting the time, now we will enter into the actual topic. So how to say this. Everyone, screen is visible. Yes, it is OK. Okay, so the topic is basic and novel approaches of parasite detection in various samples. So this, uh, first of all, we should know that what is the parasite. I think uh, the participant, uh, if they are of uh, veterinary background uh, or yeah, medical background, they know and even though people are from the biology background, they know that the different animals, uh, uh, this uh, fauna, yeah, which is there. Parasitic Hello. So this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, parasites, actually in the veterinary science, uh, we dealt with the parasites like helminths, arthropods, and protozoa. But uh, 
if you see the definition of the parasites, then you will find that the organism which depends on the other organism for their either food or shelters or both. So in that definition, you can find that even bacteria, virus, fungus, algae, that also comes. And because these subjects develop their own, so parasitology, this subject deals only the helminth arthropods and protozoa, which affects the animals or humans. So in the veterinary parasitology, we discuss the genetic pathogens as well as the uh, pathogens that affect the animals. So you can find that helminths are nematodes, cystode nematodes, and the acanthocephala that's uh, uh, normally called as a flat worm or round worm, clubs. And the arthropods, so very commonly known by everyone, that's very commonly occurs on the uh, humans also and animals, fly, flea, lice, tick mites. We'll see that uh, how they are looking. So just uh, for curiosity or for the knowledge, you can see here the different kinds of the helmet. So this... Uh, So this uh, helminth, uh, these uh, parasites you can see here, and these all are the uh, uh, different uh, small creatures which affects the either animals or humans. Then you can see here the protozoan parasites. So this is the single cell eukaryotic organism. You know that single cell prokaryotic organism is bacteria, but single cell eukaryotic organism is known as a protozoan. So this protozoan parasites, protista. So these parasites affects the animals and humans. They may be in different organs, different places. We'll come to that later on. So these here you can see the single cell organism. Then uh, this is the multicellular again organism, which is called the arthropod. So these three groups of the organism, they are classified and studied under the parasites and parasitology. Okay, so this... So where you can find these parasites? So as a definition, we know that the, the parasites are the organism which, uh, uh, which depends upon, at least for a part of their life, on other organism. So they may be uh, in the animals, they may be part of their development, maybe in environments. So you can find this Parasite like helminths in animals, excretions, secretions, where comes out to the environment. They develop in the organs or tissues. So uh, these similarly cystodes and nematodes, you can find they they are available they are present in the animals, organs, tissue, their secretions, excretions, and the environment also. So they developed partly they are developed in the environment also. Then protozoan parasites you will find they are in the either gut dwelling parasites. So they are in the simply in elementary tract. Accordingly, they are classified gut dwelling. Or they are in the tissues, various tissues, various organs of the tissues, as this is the single cell organism. They can survive inside the cells or outside the cells. So intracellular or intercellular. And some are in the bloods. So they are called hemoprotozoans. So you can find these parasites either in the gut or yeah, when they pass through the uh, secretions, excretions of the animals, you can find in the feces and then that comes to the environment. There also you can find that in environmental development also there. So they are in the environment. So and the blood hemoprotozoan, you can, you can find they are vector bone, then you can find they are in the vector too. So this... Uh, uh, Arthropods, similarly, you can find they are in the, according to the type of the arthropods, they may be the animal body surface or animal tissue also. Even you can, uh, you know that, that these all are the invertebrate uh, animals or organism or a lower group of organism, you can say. And they had the many developmental stages. And each developmental stages are very different than the their next developmental stage. Stage. Sometimes if you don't know, then you can say the two are different organisms, but that is not. 
you can you find that some fly larvae they are developed inside the animal tissue so you can find the fly larvae even in animal tissue and their development in animal dwelling places environment okay, the water bodies and the they can matter. similarly you can find the different kind of organism if they are permanent parasite they only on the animal body animal so why parasitological investigation is required so uh, actually the detection or yeah, identification of the parasitic in uh, uh, required because of the first and foremost important one is clinical management means if some animals got the infection and with that infection they develop the some kind of the manifestations that's called the disease so then you need to treat specifically so for the specific treatment you need to know that what is the etiology and it, if you know the etiology then only you can get the specific treatment and you can find that the treatment is working and another thing is the epidemiological study epidemiological study is to monitor or some surveillance for the prevention and control of this infection in the animals so prevention to prevent the infection in uninfected animals and control to stop the further spread of the infection so for both the all the three things you need to know that what actually the prevailing situation of the parasites for that you need to know you need to go for the investigation so what are the techniques what are the techniques for detection of the parasites in the samples so i think many of you know that the conventional technique because this is used since a long time so they are direct and indirect so direct means you directly seen the parasite in the animal body or samples whatever the clinical samples is so there you can find that light microscopy means microscopy simple microscopy that we say that you detect the parasites by the simple microscopy in the post mortem examination you can find yesterday class dr panda panda sir have discussed thoroughly about the, how the post mortem done and how you have to write the post mortem report that all i think uh, now you are aware that what the post mortem examination so where from uh, a skin surface surface to the one by one organ and tissues level you have to know that what are the different uh, changes or what are the foreign bodies available in that body and accordingly you have to collect the sample you have to record your observation and then you will come to the inference that what's the actual the so that then cultural test so this cultural test so not very famous in the parasitology this is very familiar famous in the microbiology where virus or a bacteria can or a fungi can be easily cultured very limited culture test is available that too mainly used for the uh, the research and development purposes very rarely used for diagnosis or investigation then biological test is also very rare used test they are uh, rarely used in the field of the parasitology but very effective these tests are called the gold standard test so this direct conventional test are gold standard because they directly identify the parasites and by looking to that you cannot deny that or you don't have the, any kind of the confusion that is it actually the etiological agent or not because directly you are looking into that the indirect method that's also very commonly used hematological and biochemical test so uh, nowadays it's uh, done with the mechanized or yeah machines also and very easily results you can get it but i can tell this at this junction that uh, these tests are not actually to diagnose this is actually for prognosis or progress of the disease 
that entails better that prognosis of the disease, that what is the status of the animal, because this is not directly dealt with the the actual parasite. Huh? If you have any kind of the marker, a specific marker, that if this marker is increased, then only that infection. But we never find that because many of the diseases, parasitic diseases, what they cause damage other liver or your heart or your lungs or your some muscles, tissues, or they affect the intestines. Very rarely they cause the specific changes. That changes also done by the other infection, bacteria or viruses. So differential diagnosis is required at the time. Or for any diagnosis, you need final diagnosis. You need to go for the battery of the test and you have to have cross-check that one test from the other. At least for the indirect method, it's very much required. So this is the conventional test. Now advanced technique also, you know this also direct and indirect methods are there. So in direct method, you can again find they detect the organism directly. Like again, here you can see the different kinds of the microscopy only. The different electron microscopy or a fluorescent microscopy, confocal microscopy, atomic force microscopy, or even SCRS. These all detect the, the these uh, parasites. But again, I can tell you these techniques are usually used in R&D, research and development, very rarely used for the screening or diagnosis of the diseases in the field situation or clinical setup. So indirect method is very much famous now, like a serological test or a molecular test. So this serological test and molecular test nowadays very famous for detection of the parasitic disease, not only parasitic disease, other infectious or non-infectious, both kind of the disease are now diagnosed by the indirect advanced diagnostic techniques that's called the serological test or molecular test. They are of many kind. So as per the WHO, what should be the ideal criteria for the any diagnostic test? So if you see for the developing and underdeveloped or undeveloped country they have given, it should be affordable because cost is very much important. You know that the, the farmers or yeah, the, the people who are keeping the animals, they are not having much economically wellness that they can afford what you can ask. So affordability is very much important. Of course, for any test, sensitivity and specificity is very important. That gives the technical importance of that particular test. So good sensitive test is required so that they can detect the parasites or your infection and this should not cross react. That gives the cross uh, sense specificity. Is there very specific? This should not cross react to the other. User friendly, definitely it should be robust and rapid. Rapidity is again very important. You will find that some of the tests like biological test or cultural test are very much specific, but you can find they are very time consuming tests. And again, it's a, because of time consuming, you can, you can find it's a costlier also. Better to be equipment free and it is deliverable to the end user. Means it's a handy and end user can be used easily. So for any diagnostic procedure, clinical materials are very much important and first for most important. Because if you have the proper clinical material or your material or sample that need to be tested. So for that, for a parasitology, you can find that the fecal sample and blood sample are very regularly used. 
for diagnosis of for your detection of the parasites in animals. So this fecal samples, those helminth parasite or your protozoan parasite and few of the arthropod also. Somebody may say that which arthropods comes in the feces. I can say that the at least one arthropod larvae, that is the gastrophilus, the larvae of the stomach bot of the horse that excreted through the feces. So the fecal sample is very much important for detection. So of the uh, stages of the parasites. Blood again. So blood samples again required for the parasite which is there in the uh, uh, hemopoietic system. Serum. Serum is required for the serological test. Nasal washing, some of the parasites in the nasal cavities, you need to detect it by the nasal washing examination. Sometimes even you can find that the parasite in a sputum, so you need to collect the sputum also. The skin scraping, some of the parasites you can find they are in the skin surface called the dermatitis. In that context, you need to collect the skin scraping. Biopsy materials, so some are in the uh, organs or some are in the tissues, um, skin or yeah, in the muscle tissues. That time you have to collect that biopsy material. Of course, during the post-mortem examination, you have to again collect the different kinds of the samples from the. Who just like calling me and I'm like. The uh, this uh, elementary tract or yeah impression smear or yeah organ wise you can collect the the tissues and the samples. Then preservation and transport of the material. So this is also very important because when you collect the sample, you may not have the time to send it to the laboratory. Or if you even want to send to the laboratory, it's not beside to you. You have to send in a proper way. Then only it will be fruitful or truly it will be examined. So right preservative and animal data sheet is very much important. So for blood, you have to send either a smear form or yeah, in the form of the whole blood, unclotted blood. So that will use for microscopy or yeah, advanced diagnostics like the PCR and other things we'll discuss later on. Fecal samples, you collect directly uh, and keep in the uh, right container and you send it or if it took time, then you can put in the preservatives like 10% formalin and you can send it to the laboratory. Tissue or whole parasite, if you are collected, you send through the ice packs or your formalin or your organ a smear, impression smear. You can stain with the methanol so that it is fixed, cell fixed on the slides, their structure fixed and they will not damage. Okay, so this way you have to. Now come to the one by one, the different methods. So light microscopy. What are the requirement? You need to have the good compound light microscope. Nowadays, it's not very costly. Okay, having the different kinds of the light microscope, attached light. Um, earlier days, it was the, um, uh, the mirror was there that uh, you keep the microscope near to the window and then you get the sunlight and you have to expose the tissues. But nowadays, LED fitted light microscope with not more than 40, 50,000 rupees, you, you can get it very good microscope, light microscope. You need a microscopic glass slide, cover sleep, droppers and others. Laboratory requirements. Sometimes you need for a certain microscopic test centrifuge machine also. And uh, some minor chemicals or reagents or stains are required, especially for blood examination or some uh, advanced version of the uh, microscopic examination of the fecal sample. So what are the samples you can analyze through this light microscopy? Fecal sample you can analyze, blood sample, urine sample, nasal discharge, skin scraping or PM samples, which you suppose that having some kind of the or is suspected that have the some kind of the parasitic 
infection in parasitic stages. So, for fecal examination, so few of the helminth parasite you can identify through that or protogen parasite which is in the guts or few arthropod I tell, told you that the gastrophilus larvae is secreted through the feces or pass through the feces of the horse in the horses. So that also you can detect in the fecal sample. Okay, so there are of microscopic and macroscopic examination, then qualitative and quantitative examination and each have the different kind of the test. So this microscopic examination means use of microscope and macroscopic examination means where you have to detect the sometimes you can find the adult parasite directly in the feces or yeah, the cystode segments in the feces. So you can find that the cystoid segment in the feces if you examine the fecal sample carefully. Even you can find the immature amphistome in the fecal samples. You can find the nematodes in the fecal samples, adult or their immature stage, developing stage. But in the same time, you can find the in their feces, their eggs, their cyst, Assist. So these kind of things you need to have required the microscope where you have to process it, load on the glass slides and observe under the microscope. So here the how much fecal sample you need to collect. Generally we have experienced that when we are asking the farmers to bring the fecal sample for diagnosis that if they are saying that some animals they are farms having some kind of the problem so generally we are saying that bring some fecal samples we'll see that what are the problems is there any uh, parasitic infection in crustaceans so they are bringing the samples in full of the bag one kg like that whatever the fixes are defecated by the animals they bring to the laboratory it is not be like that maximum you bring it 30 40 gram that is enough Okay, so at least 10 gram, you have to bring it. That is enough for any kind of the process to find that the animals is having any kind of the um, gut related parasitic infection or what. So that the best is to fresh sample that is collected directly from the rectum. But if it is not possible, if animal is not available at the uh, uh, this uh, uh, clinics or yeah, collection is not possible by the professionals, then they are collected by the farmers immediately, they defecate it. Or if the laboratory are distant, then you can mix with the saline or yeah, formalin, 9 is to 1 ratio, and you can send to the laboratory. So this feces, generally for the Epidemiological studies, at least if the flock is very large, at least 10% of the herder flock should be uh, sampled and that should be uh, screened. Then only that data will be representative for that particular flock. So before sending, one very important thing is that you have to label the the animal species from which you have collected the age because these all are very important because you know if you see the list of the parasites especially affecting the animals they are very big hundreds so uh, how you think that how many tests you will do so uh, many of the parasites are very much host specific species specific age specific so if you write the age species or sex of the animals and some parasites are even the area specific. So if you write the place of the collection, then it's easier for the persons who are doing the diagnosis of the laboratory diagnosis of that particular animals through that particular sample. So the noting of this all information are very important. So what are the methods? So direct smear methods So very simple and very Least time you can say it takes just uh, two to five minutes is sufficient to go for direct smear examination. Very simple. You just take the just uh, 
a small amount just a match stick uh, that point that much fecal sample on the glass slide simply and you put the few one drop of the water mix it and just put the cover slip and observe under 10x so you will find that the fecal samples uh, material fecal debris along with if some eggs or oocyst are there or cysts are there or any trophozoites of the uh, protozoan parasites are there so but uh, it's a so uh, rapid but it's having very serious drawbacks that if the animal is having very high infection then only you can get the results otherwise you will say the animal is not having infection means your result is false negative so that is the biggest issue so that means it has the low sensitivity so generally you can find overall we'll say that the the this uh, microscopy is less sensitive test okay so this is the and the, another thing is quantitation cannot be done it's a qualitative test further to improve it concentration method can be taken it takes some more times it requires some more um, instrumentation it requires some um, reagents so here two kinds of the concentration methods is flotation and sedimentation so both are both cannot be applied for all kind of the uh, uh, parasites so this uh, flotation usually we'll see later on that uh, this is better for the parasites whose egg is lighter in weight and sedimentation is for both kind of the things but better for the parasite whose eggs are somewhat heavier comparatively heavier so what you can find here that sedimentation or again you can find simple sedimentation or formal either sedimentation here you can find because of the gravitational force under the gravitational force they are uh, eggs are sedimenting or using the centrifuge techniques to reduce the time you can use the sedimentation technique and you can get the better <laughs> results so here you can see this way you can after mixing the fecal sample along with the uh, water simple tape water here is required nothing no reagents nothing is required here simply you have to mix the fecal sample one gram of the fecal sample in about 10 10 ml of the water mix it and put it in into a test tube after some times if you, you are not going to centrifuge it you can find that the after 15 to 20 minutes the eggs along with the some heavier fecal debris sedimented on the bottom of the tubes so you discard it the upper layer and sediment with the sediment you can go for the the <laughs> uh microscopy and you can find very clear slide though the fecal debris are there in the in the uh, this uh, uh, slide you can find but that's uh, clear because the what are the fecal stains the colors are there that's uh, goes off with the water and you can find that this uh, is now very clear and very easy to identify the parasites in on the slides so this is the sedimentation technique. Then flotation technique where you can use the flotation fluid. So here you have to make the special kind of the fluid. That fluid help to float the eggs. So you know that the specific gravity of water is one. So if you add the some solutes in that, those are soluble in that water that increase the specific gravity of the water and that solution have the higher specific gravity and you know that the physics law that the the specific gravity higher the specific gravity of the solutes the objects in that they will float so generally you can find nematode and cystode eggs have the specific gravity of 
1.1 to 1.2, while the trematode eggs having the specific gravity is higher, 1.3 to 1.35. So this, uh, by this, you know that nematode and cystode eggs is somewhat lighter compared to the trematode eggs. So this flotation technique is better for the nematode and cystode eggs. For trematode eggs, better to go for the sedimentation technique. So this uh, and even the protozoan parasites. So some of the gut dwelling protozoan uh, cysts or cysts you can get by this protection technique. So in the laboratory, very commonly, common salt or yeah, saturated sugar solution or yeah, saturated salt solution are used for this uh, uh, flotation technique. So uh, this. Uh, so this, uh, so this uh, by this way you can find these are the different kind of the So uh, I'm audible. So okay. So this uh, by this way, after uh, if you go through this all sedimentation, flotation, or direct technique of the fecal sample, then you can find that this kind of the eggs in the feces. So I told you that the large number of the parasite affecting the animals because that here different kind of animals are there from the cattle, buffalo, sheep, goat, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, dog, cats, even wild animals you can find. So, okay, so, so that's what you can find the different shape and types of the eggs. So, this uh, uh, all are called what you are looking here, that all are called the scarid eggs. 
if you see the architecture of the x they are all of same kind and uh, but the shape are of different so uh, with the experience you can easily identify that what are the different uh, x of the uh, different ascarid uh, parasite here you can see the some more kind of the x so these are the uh, parasites nematode parasite x so what you can find in the um, fecal samples of the cattle buffalo dogs cats okay so uh, here you can find the strongy legs at the different stages the strong gliders eggs so here even you can sometimes you can find the larvae in the fecal sample when you will observe the microscope some serpentine type of the movement and this tapered both the end one side tail another anterior and you can find that the uh, larvae which is moving in the field if the samples are uh, fresh and that is the against the larvae so some of the parasites they directly lay the larvae and that uh, or the lay the mature egg which by the time comes into the environment means defecated that hatch out and uh, larvae you can find in the fecal sample when you examine under the microscope so this kind of larvae even you can see here you can see again some other kind of the eggs some are of the cystode eggs nematode sex like uh, here it's a diphyllidium uh, you can see here the spirocerca you can see here the trichuris eggs these all are very commonly you can find that's in the spirocerca in the dogs trichuris in dogs as well as the ruminants that uh, diphyllidium in the dogs okay so these are the eggs so what till now we have seen that all are called qualitative methods there you can see only the eggs their quality you cannot count it and even if you count in that's not having much importance so counting with a certain uh, um, calculations that's giving the some ratio in the form of the some units so for that one methods is called mcmaster methods uh, mcmaster methods is a uh, done with a special kind of the slides that is called the mcmaster slides which having the two chambers or yes sometimes three chambers where you have to load the specific amount of the fluid in that they are made such a that they will um, take that much only 0 0.15 micro uh, ml of the fluid means 150 microliter only you count inside that how many eggs and you have to get the calculation that one gram of the feces how much eggs so epg you will get here from the mcmaster method so generally three grams of the feces are taken and mixed with the flotation fluid 42 ml of the flotation fluid becomes the 45 ml and from that 0.15 ml in each chambers we have to load and and make it average and multiply with the have 100 then you will get the if you get the 5x on an average in two chambers multiply by 100 means it's become the 500 epg 500 epg means a gram of the feces is having 500 eggs so by this way you can quantitate the how much eggs and accordingly if you know that the parasite is giving say for example ascaris ascarid is giving the 1 million eggs one parasite giving 1 million eggs in a day so now you can calculate the how much kg of the feces if you have the calculations and you can get the how many parasite in that some standards are available in the books or a research paper where you can find that if the EPG is this much for a particular parasite, see the particular animals, you can say that's a mild, moderate or severe infection or a very severe infection. It needs, it gives the idea about that, how immediate you have to take care. You have to give the immediately the anti-helminthric treatment or not so that kind of the intervention that kind of the uh, actions you can take by looking the epg data or even this is helpful in uh, getting the an anti-helminthic resistance about the your what 
anti-helminthics you are giving to the animals that's working or not is the resistance or not so these are the some of the uh, the standards that is used to say that the what is the severity of the infection so this is the sum of the data even some of the parasites are there in the urinary systems not much only few content like a cystosoma hematobium in case of the man and even in the ruminants, you can find that staphneurus in case of the pig, staphneurus dentatus, capillaria or dictyophyma, you can find in case of the carnivores, their eggs pass through the feces, uh, sorry, urine. So their eggs can be detected in the urines. It's a very simple that you centrifuge the urines and in the sediment, you put on the microscope slides and you can find that the particular eggs and you can say this is having the infection of that particular parasite. So then it's a time to the protozoan parasites. Again, I told you that protozoan parasites are of three kinds. One that affect the gut, other is a, affect the hemopoietic system, that's called hemoprotozoans, and other are the tissue protozoan that's affect the specific kind of the tissue like the muscular tissue or yes, some other liver or your kidneys, other tissues. Okay, so that, so if they are in the gut, then you can find that the parasite by again, simple method, direct smear, uh, what you have seen earlier, direct fecal smear examination, where you can put just the, some stains like eosin and lugal iodines to make it easier to detect, detection. So this, uh, some of the parasites like coccidia, which include Imeria, Cryptosporidium, Esospora, Toxoplasma, and Sarcosis, their eggs in the definitive host, Entamoeba, Examita, Giardia, Balantidium, Buxtonella, these all parasite cyst, oocyst, or trophozoite can be seen in the, the fecal um, on, under the slide easily if you stain with the eosin and lugal iodine. So here you can see some of the trophozoites and the cyst of the parasites. Here Giardias trophozoites, Tritrichomonas trophozoites. Here the cyst of the Antamoeba. You can find here that under the microscope, you can easily identify that one. Then you can see here the few of the trophozoites and the cyst of this uh, uh, Boxtonella or Balantidium coli as well as coccidian sporulated or sporulating oocyst. Okay, so these are the things you can get. These are the protozoan parasite, which grow into the tissue of the gut or yeah, freely they develop into the gut. Then you can see here, this is the very small protozoan parasite. This is the oocyst of the cryptosporidium. It is hardly three to four micron in size. So you need to stain, a special stain is required, modified MZN stain, and then you can get the very small kind of 100x amplification, magnification, you can find that this parasite. Now, the what to the blood parasites? So for that, you can go for the blood smear examination. So with that blood smear examination, you have to take the again slides, very clear, grease-free slides. You make the... Um, very thin slide on that blood slides and then you go for the uh, their processing after drying it. First, you have to fix with the methanol, then uh, go for the staining. That's a gymsa or uh, field stain or uh, uh, Lisman stain are generally used. I experience that the gymsa is very best that uh, though it's take us some time, but it's a, a stain is very good and uh, very easy to read the slide. So gymsa stain is uh, uh, available, ready to use form or even in the powder form. So you can make in your laboratory. If you making your own, then you should know that how to make it. Generally, the stains need aging. So you have to, it's not that today you have made the gymsa stain and tomorrow just you have to use. You have to give them some aging, then only it will be good stain. Otherwise, you purchase the ready-to-use gymsa stain. It's available with high media or many others. We are using here with the high media gymsa stain, 1 is to 30 in the dilution ratio, and then 40 to 45 minutes, 
and if you want to reduce the time that is also sometimes give the better if you are having the some emergency case you have to again you keep the dilution at lower uh, side one is to 20 for 20 minutes is sufficient okay so that way that can be done but uh, diluting one is to 10 and thinking that within 10 minutes it will be then you will not get a uh, good slide you will be confusion confusing a stage and many a times even the artifacts looks like the parasite okay so actually in the protozoan parasite diagnosis especially the hemo hemoprotozoan diagnosis is somewhat difficult they are unicellular intracellular and very small size parasite just two micron or three micron parasite lesser than that it's difficult to identify so uh, some experience or skills are required for that so you can see here the some of the hemoprotozoans after staining gymsa stain you can find here the flagellates like the trypanosoma in the blood this extracellular parasite then you can find intracellular parasite two of these one side you can see hemoprotozoan in the uh, generally you can find it is the mononuclear cells uh, morphonuclear cells like uh, neutrophils and even you can find the babesia in the pair acute pair that's uh, the uh, affect the cattle buffalo and even some human species are there like babesia microti babesia divergence like that even you can see uh, the birds parasite like hemoproteus in the rbc you know the rbc of the birds are nucleated and you can find here the thylaria parasite inside the rbc you can find here the this is not the actually protozoan parasite you can see it's a rickettsial it's a bacterial like protozoan it's somewhat different than the bacteria that's what they are classified under the ricket seals okay they are some differences are there with the bacteria like their growth or yeah there are some uh, cytoplasmic content okay so this uh, required the the uh, actually this is studied by the parasitology since uh, beginnings because they are uh, stand and they are um, while looking to the hemoprotozoans they are also come across and they are studying so rickets cells especially the anaplasma or lychia uh, this uh, cytogenes okay hemobartonella these all are studied though they are bacteria under the parasitology so here you can see the arlichia and anaplasma anaplasma has a dot like an arlichia inside the monocytes you can see it's a morular stage <clears throat> they are very important and they cause very severe disease even some of the helminth parasite detected by the blood examination so you know that this uh, the filarial worm so filarial worm that filaria you know the inhumans the loa loa or yeah, ucheria that affect the uh, humans but in the animals numbers of the filarial worms are there they affect the different kind of the tissues they affect the skin they affect the ligament nuke they affect the uh, muscles the subcutaneous tissue even they are in the heart they are in the eye they are in the uh, outer they are in different locations and their larvae that is called the microfilaria you can find in the blood so by the examining the blood you can find the the microfilaria and that give the indication that animal is infected with some kind of the filarial worm for that you can go for the not concentration method with that you can use here the formalin 2% formalin mix it centrifuge it and then put the methyl uh, methylene blue or a methylene methyl green solution to stain the parasite to differentiate it from the background uh, blood cells and then you can easily find under the microscope this kind of the filarial larvae Okay, so this is the larvae of the filarial worm you can find in the uh, <clears throat> blood. Now, we have now learned about the many things about the microscopy, simple microscopy of the parasites. What we have detected, what we have looked, we have looked till now that many a cases the eggs, few cases the larvae, but it will be very important to know that eggs or yeah, what larvae we came to know through the microscopy, they are not having the clinical significance. Clinical significance are of immature stages of the parasite. In case of trematodes, immature flukes, which cannot be detected by microscopy. 
in case of cystode you can find metacystodes or immature parasites that is the cause of the pathogenesis that is not detected through the microscopy in case of the nematodes rod worm rod round worms and acanthocephala migrating larvae l3 l4 l5 even adults they are the actual the pathog pathogens not the eggs eggs are simply secreted out so infection uh, actually pathogenesis is caused by the the different stages of the parasite because you know that this uh, the <clears throat> a small group of the parasite having the number of the uh, these stages life stages and they are antigenically also different their features morphological features are different their antigenicity is also different and their pathogenesis is also different because the different stage of the parasite stay in different organs or tissues and that is not detectable by the simple microscopy so what you are detecting that is helpful for the epidemiological studies to know that the animal is having infection whatever the pathogenesis the parasite have already did in the animals they are animal are suffered now at the end of the parasite life they become adult then only you are able to detect their eggs or their secreted larvae so this microscopy actually this is good for the epidemiology again the you can say that microscopy is not able to actually or yeah in the field level we came to know in future uh, in the coming slide that when we'll compare with the, the the advanced diagnostics then you can find that microscopy is a not throughput techniques you cannot do the hundreds of the sample detects uh, examination by the microscopy very limited number of the samples can be detected so one side it's uh, important for epidemiological studies better for epidemiology and another side it is having the not uh, throat pushness you cannot mechanize it so this is the uh, the real challenge to the microscopy of course because it's a direct method and uh, this specificity is very high you can say that it's a trematode means it trematode if you say it's a fasciola means fasciola egg it's not with something else so that's way this is the very much gold standard test they are called now we'll come to the similarly in the the protozoan parasite here we detect the uh, parasite cyst to cyst or yeah in the blood the parasite through the microscopy but again you will get it when the animals are in the severe condition acute condition you cannot or a very rare to detect the parasite in case of subclinical infection chronic phase of infection because that time the parasite are not in normal circulations okay so that you can not easy to identify in the clinical samples and even as differentiating such a small parasite single cell parasite at a species level is challenging so a species identification many a times is very difficult through the microscopy now next is a culture test i told you is very beginning that the culture test is not very popular in the micro parasitology field because it's not very <clears throat> very limited number of this culture technique is available okay it's take a longer duration and it's a costlier test so it's generally used in research and development so some of the cultures are standardized and available like the triple n media is used for lismania culture diphagic coagulated egg slant with a lox solution containing the serum for the intermeba diamonds monophagic media also used for intermeba development histomonas milagridis for that you can use the culture media 199 with the cream and bacteria then devers media trichomonas again having the some of the media like diamond trichomonas cp lm media bgps media oxide trichomonas media so like that some of the hyaluria again can be cultured in the laboratory 
that uh, uh, joint culture you can do even the pyroplasm culture for limited um, time you can done in the laboratory using the rpmi 1640 and with the other antibiotics and other um, reagents similarly plasmodium falciparum babesia culture can be done but this all are not regularly done for the parasite detection usually these all cultures are used for the the research purpose or your uh, generation of more and more so what you have seen majority of this culture is for the protozoan parasite and not for the helminth parasite then biological test again it's uh, having the very very limited biological test where you can find the animal inoculation test or genodiagnosis are used like the trypnozoma detection can be done by inoculating the suspected blood samples just 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 microliter of the blood samples intraperitoneally in the mice so after few days you can find that in the blood if the sample is positive for trypnozoma then you can find in the blood of the mice after five to six days after five days onwards you can find that the blood is having the trypanosome so similarly toxoplasma gondii infection can also be detected in the mice by injecting the suspected material into the intraperitoneal region of the mice intraperitoneal injection and subsequently you can get intraperitoneal fluid after five to six days and you can get the trachezoids in the um, the peritoneal uh, fluids under the microscope Babesia can be detected by the genodiagnosis, feed the babish ticks, the ticks free of the infection. You feed on the animals suspected for an infection and then pick up the ticks. Then you look the developed stage in the next generation ticks. If it is a, the trans uh, stadial transmission in the salivary gland or if it is trans ovarian, then you can find in the uh, the the even you can find the developing uh, this uh, in the um, hemolymph so that also gives the uh, indication of the but this all takes the time and this is not regularly taken it's uh, generally used in the research purposes okay because the better than that or yeah, uh, uh, if the parasite identification is required then it uh, it has been done then hematobiochemical test, I already told you that hematobiochemical test is the supportive test. It cannot be taken exclusively because this uh, gives the idea about the, the, the progress of the disease. It's not, if you're not having the particular markers for a particular disease, then it's a very difficult to say by looking to the hematological and biological parameter that it's specifically having the this particular infection. Yeah, you can see if the GGT is increased, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase is increased in the serum, then you can say there is a infection of the, or there is a damage of in the epithelium of the, the bile duct. But bile duct epithelium damage can be by the many other ways also. It's not that fasciola only damage the bile duct epithelium. So, but it's indicate that the there is some kind of the problem by luck. So then you can go for the other test and you confirm it or otherwise you can take it further and uh, look that the, the progress of the disease and you can come to the um, some uh, conclusion that the some kind of infection of this kind might be there. Okay, so these hematological parameters or biochemical parameters this is very supplementary test, complementary test, and this is to know the, the progress of the disease. So this you can find. Then we come to the some advanced test now. So immunodiagnostic method. So immunodiagnostics, you know that the uh, they are uh, indirect test. They are either detecting the antigens or antibodies developed in the animals against the particular foreign bodies that may be other parasites. So this antigens detection can considered better than the antibody detection, but antigen detection tests are somewhat uh, 
not easy somewhat uh, um, very little tests are available antibody detection tests are very easier to develop and you can find this is uh, many kind of the tests available antibody detection test this test actually immunodiagnostics tests are very good for the epidemiological studies that gives the idea about the the disease prevalence in a particular geographical area prevalence of a particular infection in a particular because once parasite in enters that means some kind of antibodies definitely there in animal bodies and you can say yes if antibodies means that particular things are prevailing in this area but you cannot say that the at that particular point of the time that is there or not okay that is the disadvantage of antibody test but antigen tests are good some of the tests are developed based upon this uh, in commercialized many are in not available in india in uh, and uh, you know that the major uh, problems is the the cost of this test are very high and their cross reactivity their specificity and uh, uh, majority are developed in the human beings for the humans for the animals you know the funding and other things that restrict the development of this the test so lateral flow chromatographic MNSA that called the rapid test rapid antigen test or rapid antibody test okay so nowadays very famous that's uh, within a uh, few minutes you get the some kind of the results yeah again this is the uh, test very good that depends upon their uh, specificity because always you can find that the this immunological test is having very good sensitivity but specificity is very much compromised because cross reactivity is a major challenge and uh, in the parasitology it's a very much uh, these uh, problems are there so very little uh, this kind of the test you can find in the parasites. Uh, few tests we came to know that in case of the human beings, so human medicines, you can find that are some of the tests, this kind of tests are available against the uh, uh, malaria parasites, okay, or some other uh, parasites. I came to know here the parasite F test or yeah, ICT malaria PF test, that's the immun immunographic test. But you see here again, there the specificity and sensitivity is uh, um, lower compared to the PCR. Okay, so that is the problem. But the thing is, it's a very fast and very immediate. You can get it, the information. So once you get the information, you can have the time again to treat the animal accordingly. And further, you have to go for the next test to confirm it. So cross-testing is also important. So relying on the single test many a times uh, gives the failure in the treatment. So uh, here you can see that the some disadvantage already I have discussed that antibody detection test suffered with the, some of the limitations like cross reactivity, inability to discriminate in active from past infection and cannot be used as a test of the cure. And similarly antigen based serodiagnostics also having Limitations, the first limitation is development. Challenging to identify the suitable antigens, which is detected, de detectable with a high sensitivity and specificity. And because of that, you can find it's a compromised sensitivity. <coughs> now we come to the nucleic acid based test. Nowadays, this is very famous and very much uh, used in the different laboratories and uh, for many of the uh, diagnosis and uh, I, I think now everyone know about this test nucleic acid acid based test post covid era because you know that everyone say the uh, this uh, the uh, rt pcr test rt pcr test so everyone talking about the rt pcr test and this actually nothing but it's a nucleic acid based assay that's a very much uh, <clears throat> important and nowadays very much developed it has the many kind of the test starting from the simple PCR or you call the single PCR or conventional PCR to many of its uh, variations, variants. In that one, you can find real-time PCR also one of the variants of the PCR, simple PCR. 
so this pcr was uh, developed by the very famous scientist that's uh, carry mullis who is the biochemist by its degree and uh, they have developed this the device they have developed the protocol the simple pcr simplest form of pcr in very early of the year uh, 1985 that the pcr machine and nowadays we have many advanced advanced version of the pcr in our laboratory so what's actually the pcr or yeah is a replication technology because you know that the, all the living cells are having the nucleic acids nucleic acids means it's a dna or rna so this dna or rna is having replicating nature in the nature in the cells so in the living cells they repl replicate they become one to two two to four means they are becoming or of same kind so in the cells there is a some enzymes some of the chemical environment under that that's happen but in the laboratory the same things done in a machines because you know that the this is a molecules so the small molecules that cannot be seen by microscope or yeah anything they can be observed by the some kind of the very high instrumentation okay that is not used in generally for looking to the dna but if we make it large in number so that called the amplification if we amplify the particular dna portion then it become the large in number and when become is a good number of the dna then it can be mixed with the some dye or some of the chemicals and can be observed so with this background that the pcr developed and on that so in the natural cells the pcr cycling or replication happens with the help of the different kind of enzymes but in the pcr it happens with the one enzymes that is called polymerase and rest of the things by the temperature so this temperature combinations and the polymerase enzymes these two things along with the input materials reagents that makes the one dna into number of the dna that replications is called the in vitro replication so this in vitro replications happens and a specific so a specificity of the pcr actually given by the pcr primers so for any kind of the pcr this pcr primers is the master so if you have the best pcr primers the specific pcr primers your taste is very much specific your taste is very much sensitive so sensitivity and specificity of the pcr is depend upon this pcr primers so those microbiologists or your diagnostics those are working on the field they are trying to develop the doing the research to get the best and best pcr primers so that they will go to a particular a specific region of the dna and that leads to the replication of the dna and you will get the specific product and that specific product will be the specificity for the particular parasite and this way this pcr detecting the so here i so you so knew that the by the help of the some kind of the uh, this uh, uh, softwares and with the sum of the uh, standards the pcr primers can be designed that can be tested and can be synthesized and used for development of the the pcr so for pcr there is a three steps first step is isolation of the nucleic acid material means dna or rna material so there is a protocol so with that protocol you have to isolate suppose you have the fecal sample so there is a protocol that isolation of the dna from the fecal sample because you know the fecal sample having the parasite or yeah many other organism whatever so if you mix with the some kind of the reagents 
some kind of the uh, processing you do then whatever the dna is there that will comes separated and comes in your the uh, elute so no you have to detect the parasite in that dna so that dna is representative of that fecal sample now from that dna you have now the specific primers suppose you want to detect the fasciola so now you put the fasciola specific primer in that and put into the machine pcr machine where they will change the temperature they put the different kind of temperature and then if the fasciola is there in the fecal sample their eggs or whatever materials related to fasciola then that dna is will comes into the dna extraction fluid and then the primer will react to that and amplification happens and if amplification happens that means the infection is there in the animals so it's an indirect way so detection of that amplification is on the gel electrophoresis so gel on that gel you run and you will with that you can get the the image of the dna so this way you will get the so here you can see that the this kind of the materials required for the amplifications where you can put the buffers the initial materials for replications because you know agtc is the required dntp is containing that all nucleotides four nucleotides primers you have to put forward and reverse primers you have to put the samples you have to put the water to make it and then one enzyme polymerase enzyme dna polymerase so make it the volume so this is the protocol very commonly known it's known so then you put into the pcr machines and you go for the amplifications so that here standardization has to be done that watch temperature of the annealing is required so accordingly you have to put into the machines so these all are standardized when the test is standardized means everything is known that how much temperature we have to keep for the denaturation annealing and extension and finally after it takes the 40 minutes to one hours or two hours depends upon the how big dna you are going to amplify so sometimes if you amplify you make the primer such that it will amplify only 200 or 300 base pairs of the dna and with that your purpose is solved it's better to do that because you will take a less time for amplification because less size means less time so even we have the sum of the PCR where 40 minutes is sufficient for complete amplification, 35 cycle of amplification. So that kind of the, even nowadays, some of the fast tag is come, uh, tag polymerase is coming that to very fast. So there you need not to keep the one minute for one KB of the uh, DNA, just in a second, 10 uh, to 15 second for 1 kb of dna so very less time is required just uh, 2 3 second is sufficient for extension for 2 3 uh, 100 of the base pair okay so this way time is now reduced so this uh, is the second variation is multiplexing so single pcr means single parasite identification now suppose the animal is having the babesia thylaria trypanosoma all kind of infection multi infection is very common so detecting single single takes that more time more chemicals are required so concept is multiplex pcr simultaneously you keep the all kind of primers in a same pcr you optimize your pcr you make your primer such a that that they all amplified at the same temperature same condition with a, some differences in their size so that you can detect on the gel that size 200 means trypanosoma, 300 means babesia, 400 means thylaria. So at, if you, you find the different size band is coming, then you can say that it's a, all the three. So accordingly, you have to design and you will get this kind of the three different bands and you can say three different parasite infection. Okay, so like that. So this is advantageous in in that that save the time cost but disadvantage it sometimes is very difficult that multiple primers they are not many a times compatible so you need to work more and more so that make it more compatible you have to develop the primer such a that so development is sometimes 
difficult uh, if you put the more number of parasites. But duplex or triplex PCR making that was not much difficult. More than that, some publications are there pentaplex PCR means five, even five parasites can be detected. But if you increase, definitely your PCR sensitivity will reduce. So you will find that sensitivity is less of this multiplex PCR compared to single PCR if you increase the number of parasite detection. So these are the sometimes you can find the limitation. That's what development is a regular process. You will find that sometimes that primers you may get the such a that that will amplify effectively the all the three, four parasites simultaneously. Then it will be very easy to have the results in a short period of time for the multiple infection. Okay, so similarly PCR RFLP. Generally, it is done for the genotyping or yeah, species identification. So many a times we develop the PCR for the genus level because with this uh, many genus, like you can find that Babesia is having many species like Babesia bigemina, Babesia bovis, Babesia canis, Babesia vogeli, Babesia um, <clears throat> divergence, Babesia microti. So many species are there of Babesia. That means you have to develop the one one set of primer for all the species. But even by single Babesia specific primary, if you make, then they will amplify all the Babesia. So whatever the Babesia that will amplify. Now, if you need to further to know that which species, then you have to develop the PCR RFLP. So here you have to put the specific enzymes, restriction enzymes that again by the bioinformatics, you come to know that which enzymes is specific for which species for a particular segment of the DNA. If you know that one, then you have to put in that amplicons that particular restriction enzymes and you will come to know that if digestion occurs, you can say, yes, this is the species of the Babesia. And if not, you can say it is not. So like that, it's helpful in even the identification of the species and genotyping of the parasites and many other cases also it is used. So this use the restriction enzyme. So this way. Now, real-time PCR, I told you that everyone talking about in the COVID period, the party PCR test and all. Actually, real-time PCR ka sort also the RT-PCR, but that RT-PCR different than this PCR, real-time PCR. Both are real-time PCR. RT-PCR is also real-time PCR. That's a, uh, <coughs> reverse transcriptase PCR. So, reverse transcriptase PCR we are doing in case of the corona time. That is also the par type of real-time PCR. Real-time PCR means this PCR need not require the, the post-PCR processing. In the previous PCR, whatever we have learned about the multiplex PCR or your simple PCR or your PCR RFLP, that all you need to make a gel, you have to load the product and you have to look into that. Then only you will get the results but in case of real time means you, in the real time means every amplification every reaction you can get on the monitor that is it reacting or not that's what is called real time pcr and rt pcr means reverse transcriptase pcr because the bacteria virus that is the coronavirus is rna virus on the rna you cannot do the pcr because rna is very much unstable product so you make it dna and making the RNA to DNA is called reverse transcription. So that's what this called the reverse transcriptase RT-PCR. But that RT-PCR is also real-time PCR. By the real-time PCR you are getting. Real-time PCR is very good. It's the best I can say among all the PCR. Only the disadvantage is here the cost. The cost of the instrument, cost of the their reagents. But if you leave the cost, if you leave the reagent cost and the instrumentation cost, this is the best diagnostic now that you can find can be used in the laboratory for the diagnosis of the diseases. Only things you should have the particular test, developed test. Here again, primers are required. And the specificity and sensitivity of again this um, machines this real time pcr is depends upon that majorly depends upon that the primers because primers is that which specifically goes and react to the 
particular the uh, segment of the DNA. Here you can find the many options are there for detection system. So cyber green, TACMAN, molecular backbone, scorpion. So these are the different kinds of the probes and the the mechanism that used for real time detection. The amplification happens. Every reaction they will give the indications. Among these all, you can find that the probe based, like Tecman probes or molecular backbones or scorpion primers, so these all are probe based. They are the better one, having the very high sensitivity near to the 100% and specificity compared to the cyber green. But cyber green, you no, know, again, the cost comes because we are under developing countries. We are not developed. We are not having much. Uh, our client is not having the animal owners is not having that much money or people also is very poor here to pay <clears throat> the cost of the the uh, this uh, test so usually we use the cyber green assay which is comparatively less costlier than the tacman or backbone or scorpio so cyber bus cyber green is somewhat i cannot uh, tell every each and everything here but you can see that cyber green is based upon the amplification cycles. So sometimes if the false amplification happens, sometimes if the primer gets self-amplified, even that will show that the amplification is going on. But the one, um, uh, the uh, objectives are the one mechanism is there by that way you can even detect this one that it is the non-specific or specific amplification in case of cyber green for that you have to go for the melt curve analysis so if you go for melt curve analysis then it will took again 20 30 minutes more so for getting the specific results with the cyber green essay even you can get it but only things again, time will increase. But for Techman or molecular backbone or scorpion, you will find within the 30 to 40 minutes, all results come that the what happens in the real time, you will get that amplification, actual amplification, what's going on. And you will get that the animal is infected or not. Okay, so this way. So if this is the amplification plot in real time, you will get this sigmoid curve indicate that that how much parasite content and this is can this also done multiplic multiplexing so multiplex real time also developed so two three parasite can be identified simultaneously in a single reaction so multiplexing of course so that's a, again some challenges are there you have to develop a such a primer combinations that is not self react and then only okay so this is the what i told you that the dissociation curve or melt curve with this analysis if that melting temperature falls within your estimated melting temperature then only you can say that your product is amplified if not then it means that the amplification are of non-specific some other misamplification has done okay so this is now next is the lamp essay now this lamp is also very much uh, uh, um, familiar and uh, you can find for the each and every parasites and majority of the parasites and uh, not only parasites some other uh, non-infectious uh, detection of the genes or uh, nucleotides they are used okay so lamb base assay we have developed again the trypnosoma evensi okay we use the rotate 1.2 uh, gene this is very specific to the trypnosoma evensi okay and uh, this uh, is very uh, sensitive and specific test here. It's uh, considered as somewhat, it's a field-based test because it's a less complicated than the PCR. Okay, it's a visual detection can be done. You can, uh, you need not to have um, the gel electrophoresis or costly instrumentation. Here the simple instrument, just a simple water bath, simple, centrifuge low cost simple centrifuge simple water bath is sufficient to develop this test 
Okay, so they are considered somewhat uh, less sophisticated test, but good in the sensitivity and specificity for detection. Okay, so this you can see here it's a cyber green based lamp test. Okay, so lamp was actually developed by the Notomi in 2000. Okay, so this is Japanese scientist who have first reported the lamp reactions. And uh, after that, you can find number of publications and people are using this lamp. Okay, so this is cost effective molecular assay with high specificity and sensitivity. Okay, so this uh, the important thing is that here you need to have the four or six pair uh, means three uh, two or three pairs of the primer required. So this primer pairs they are uh, you have to the challenge is that developing this test that the development of the primers i told you that nucleic acid based test whatever that's a, uh, the primer is most important so developing the primer is a challenge so uh, some softwares are there and with the some of the information that what you have to uh, take at three prime end and what not and uh, again the rechecking of the primers by the blast analysis okay to come to the specificity, the cross reactivity test, many uh, softwares uh, with the softwares, and uh, then you come to know that uh, with the uh, uh, this primer may work. Okay, so you have to get the three, four uh, such set of the primer, and you have to work on that, and which will get the better without cross reactivity. You can develop it here. You can see that the we have shown you that the map of the primer designing the location where we have designed the six set of the primers okay for the development of the the lamp piece here here you they are say outer primers internal primers and loop primers okay so these primers are uh, developed and uh, here again required the some set of the chemicals because you see the six primers you have to uh, put into then dntps required of course magnesium sulfate for the um, this reactions uh, 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 betaine that is called the PCR enhancer then BSM buffer or yeah, polymerase BSM DNA polymerase this is uh, actually the polymerase which is uh, <clears throat> having the self uh, DNA displacement activity so need not to have the difference uh, different uh, temperature as the PCR is required, the denaturation, annealing, and uh, extension, amplification, temperature different. Here, a single temperature, like 60 to 62 degree temperature, if you put for 40 to 60 minutes, you can find that reaction happens. Okay, so this way you can, uh, if you see in the gel, then you can find that because these primers are making the loops, so you can find that in the gel, ladder like pattern. If you see that the amplification of this and if you put the cyber green in that after amplification 40 to 60 minutes then you can find if the cyber green you put just a diluted cyber green just a one microliter if that cyber green turn into green actually cyber green color you can find it's a orange in color if it turn into green after adding that indicate the amplification and that's indicate the positiveness okay so in uh, can see here in the photographs the positive negative and uh, ntc is non template control means control also you can find no reactions further if you want to confirm that the, that is the specific or non specific so this is actually research we have did that to confirm that the amplification is not non specific so we have digested again that we know that uh, the what part of the dna is amplifying what is the RE in that particular region? So we use that particular RE and digested. So if digested means that particular DNA is amplified. So that we have did and we find that digestion happens and that confirm that the amplification is of a specific type and what changes we can find in the uh, tubes after adding the uh, this uh, uh, what is called the cyber green that's the uh, actual that's the right that the amplification happens so that's the indicates and we again we did the uh, on the range of the field samples and we find that 
this is a highly sensitive and compared with the PCR and we came to know that they are par with the PCR and uh, they are highly sensitive test. So uh, what's the limitation of the PCR? So everything having the limitations, all the things having the pros and cons. Okay, so it's not that the lamp. The lamp thinks is that some of the reagent kept at minus 20 degrees. So you need to have the some kind of the refrigeration. So how to use on the field level. But not is some chemical schemes that can be used at the room temperature. So that is the now the advantage. So another thing still for the developing the lamp primer, the challenge is that amplification means amplicon should not be in the larger size. So shorter period. So many a times you can find that it's difficult to develop the primers to amplify shorter that two or six different kind of primers. Okay, so that is the challenge. Then visual detection. Simply sometimes uh, if you're not adding the any kind of the cyber gain, actually when we are putting the magnesium sulfate, so magnesium form the precipitation and even without adding the cyber green, you can find the some kind of haziness in the positive reaction. Okay, because of the precipitation. So this uh, uh, is if you not add the uh, this uh, cyber green or some other dye, then it's many a times difficult to read the positiveness. So that is and one other thing here you can find that many primers are used. That is again the limitations that increase the cost. In the simple PCR only two primers are required here. Six primers are required. Minimum fourth requirement high heat. Okay, but advantage you can see it's detect the variety of the samples, uh, detect uh, and it's a very high sensitivity. BST DNA polymerase is a very robust DNA polymerase. They are not inhibited by the different the inhibitors present in the samples like immunoglobulins, yeah, hemes or any serum, and even it can be done directly on the uh, urine and other samples. Okay, again. Uh, this is the uh, not required so sophisticated persons. It's a very simple instrumentation is there. So less skilled person, if you make it learn, they can do. Okay. And less time is required. So that is. There. Now, uh, this uh, sequencing technique. So you know that the, this is also the very important one. So uh, again, this is very uh, not routinely used for the uh, field diagnosis, but Sometimes it is required for confirmation of the diagnosis, especially when we don't know the particular parasites uh, uh, presence in a particular geographical area. Uh, this is more important in case of the uh, research site, identifying the species or subspecies or some special strains. And sometimes in case of the, uh, in the wildlife area where many things we don't know, the what are the uh, things are circulating in the wildlife area, so wild animals, that time we have the primers specific to the uh, genus specific primers or yeah, um, for a particular group of the parasite, we have the some kind of the primer which can amplify a different species, okay. But uh, to know that, we don't have the initial information to make the species specific PCR. At that time, this sequencing is very much effective. Okay, so we have did many a times there earlier. We are in the gear area. We are getting the the samples from the gear lions, uh, the jaguars, and the many other animals. There, uh, we don't know. We don't have any data regarding the the what are the parasites circulating in that area. Usually we are using the primers, uh, genus specific primers, and then we are sending sample for sequencing. And after sequencing, we put sequence into the NCBI because you know the NCBI is the, the database where they are, uh, the whole entire world, they are putting their uh, sequence data into that of different kinds. So nucleotide blast is very famous. By that, if you have the some kind of nucleotide data, you can put into that blast and you can get, you will get the, the, uh, the what kind of the species based on the matching, based on the 
the the the uh, the uh, alignment of the the new uh, nucleotide sequence you have get with that the the repositories so what are the uh, how much uh, uh, this uh, similarity they are showing so if they are showing good similarity 95 percent 96 98 percent 99 and even 100 percent similarity we can find that so that indicate that this is a particular kind of the parasite okay so this uh, way you can identify the the uh, some unknown species there uh, the 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 species level or yeah sometimes uh, genotyping you can know by the sequencing so this is not routinely used but sometimes very much important and not a sequencing is not a very difficult task it's not costlier also it's uh, can be done very cheap cost simply per sample uh, uh, 500 or 500 or 600 maximum i think uh, they based upon the different kind of the commercial house or many of the government uh, institution also giving the services to get the sequencing okay so now sequencing is not big issues so uh, this is a simple sequencing and even you know that the knowledge the the next generation sequencing is going on this is also not the much um, uh, problematic as it was earlier nowadays the for the entire set of the whole length genome sequencing can be done uh, within a, a few hours it was uh, when the first human genome sequencing was done it took the years okay so now it's a few hours within a day it will be completed okay so this uh, sequencing technology now is a very important and uh, with that uh, any unknown things can be identified with that sequencing technology so this is also used now the parasitology for detection of the uh, the parasites no to the species or yeah, their genotypes uh, their strains so this this way you can uh, get it so with this uh, um, i thanks to everyone uh, that uh, or if any questions are there, I'm happy to take it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for a nice and informative presentation. Now all the participants, they are requested if someone having doubt, they can clarify their doubts through asking questions to sir. sir Stop sharing. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, sir, I have a small query. Yeah, yeah. Please. Sir, regarding the parasitic overload. Yeah. Do we have any restriction that some amount of uh, over present in the fetal sample based on like threshold? Is there a threshold for uh, uh, pathogenicity, sir? Or uh, actually, did you uh, get me, sir? Like when we do fetal examination? Yeah, actually, uh, this uh, the threshold limit, uh, if you say so, that threshold limit. Um, is depends upon the parasite to parasite. Okay, so if you take the example yes, sir, of fasciola, if you take the example of fasciola, so this uh, uh, fasciola, few fasciola, okay, so few fasciola is sufficient to uh, damage the, uh, if you are available in the uh, adult form in the this bile duct, they damage the bile duct, they cause the some kind of the problems. Another point is that the fasciola is very uh, low, uh, uh, have the very low fecundity, means their egg number compared to the ascaris is very low. Okay, so their number of eggs are very low. So even 
large number of fasciola if it is there in the animal body, the chances of getting the fasciola egg in fishes are very less. In reverse condition, if you see the scaries, so one scaries give the large millions of the egg. Here it's a about 100, 200 eggs were millions of the eggs. So if the scaries number is very large or even very less, number of eggs in the feces you will find very high. So the threshold limit for any kind of the parasites is uh, depends upon the, the what kind of parasite is in animal body. So that is, I think, your questions. Sir, where can we get information regarding this? Because I have searched some books, but I could not get actual information. I am working in a, a clinical complex laboratory, sir. When I do some fecal examination, the animal uh, is not showing any symptoms, but parasitic load is there, but the animal is asymptomatic. But sometimes when there is only one or two of all, so animal is showing uh, very good symptoms. Yeah, yeah, again, you see that the uh, it's not that the in the field condition single infection majority of time you will find this is the multiple infection so multiple infection uh, means uh, uh, if you see sometimes you will find that the lot of the uh, this coccidia in the fecal sample an animal is not having any problems and same things you will find in the and other animals that coccidia is there and having the severity. That means they have some other two, the other infection too. So you have to check the all the all kind of the things. Okay, so again, you have to look into that the what uh, coccidia is or yeah, what uh, uh, that uh, uh, particular parasite. So I have shown in the uh, our slide that uh, uh, that uh, the this uh, the standard i have taken from this uh, uh, manuals okay we have uh, um, uh, one book is there and uh, some information we got collected from the different publications okay research papers so accordingly you can see here that we have made that the according to the animals and according to the the uh, species of the parasite that uh, you can find that the different uh, severity of the pathogens. Okay. So here, Himonkas, you can see 200 is light infection in cattle and uh, more than 500 is uh, for the severity. Similarly, Fasciola is uh, simply, uh, you can find that the uh, uh, this uh, 500, more than 500, severe, moderate, 200 to 500. So like that, some of the information is available in some books uh, you can find even uh, in the souls by it is there okay it's not uh, my comp compilation is from the some of the research paper some information is available in souls by and some in the some uh, manuals uh, one diagnostic uh, dr uh, veer singh sir is there the the author of that particular uh, books uh, uh, laboratory diagnostic of parasitic disease okay so this uh, uh, from there we have collected so this is the uh, some of the data you can keep it and uh, you can get the uh, but the things uh, you find that the mixed infection problems in the field so uh, animal having the some hemoprotozoan disease along with that the parasitic disease then severity of infection animal is having the some kind of the uh, this helminthic infection along with some viral or bacterial disease, you find the very severe condition. So uh, this kind of the infection things you have to look into. Any parasites are there, definitely that give the stress to the animals. So you give the treatment, uh, suggest the treatment or yes, some uh, <clears throat> kind of the remedies so that the stress reduced and you can find that animal will uh, recover. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Please. Okay. Okay. 
thank you all the participants for uh, uh, present uh, to be present in the presentation uh, and uh, uh, sparing your valuable time with us and thank you dr binod kumar sir for sharing his uh, knowledge and uh, for giving elaborate discussion regarding uh, different mm -hmm. parasitologic diagnosis mm -hmm. methods and uh, which are uh, which will be helpful to all our uh, participants who who may be a student who may be a researcher and thank you all today we are going to uh, com complete our session for a uh, second day uh, thank you thank you thank you to all